All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, every week at this time, we're joined by our friend Charles Hurt, columnist for the Washington Times. And uh, Charles, uh, as always, great piece. But uh, you, you talk about a book. And of course, the title of your, your column at the WashingtonTimes.com is uh, Book Tells Heart-Wrenching Story of Arlington House. Arlington House, which um, is, uh, sits in the, in, the, in the center kind of, a, of a Arlington National Cemetery. And you talk about... Um, what it represents and how you fear that uh, a lot of the folks who uh, who work there have a problem with part of what it represents. And then you talk about a great new book uh, that uh, that picks up on on Robert E. Lee and and, uh, and talks about him in the, the the really the way he should be uh, portrayed. So explain that all to the folks. Yes, yeah, yeah, Steve, it's a wonderful new book by a, a new writer named Jonathan Horn, uh, who, who is a, a, a speechwriter for, for George W. Bush. And uh, it's, a, it's a new book uh, called uh, The Man Who Would Not Be Washington. And it, it's, uh, you know, getting into, you know, writing your first book about uh, uh, characters like uh, George Washington and Robert E. Lee, whom the book is largely about, uh, it, you know, it's easy to kind of think this would be well-picked over uh, <laughs> uh, territory. But he did a very nice job of going back and telling the, the story of, the, the, all the descendants of Mount Vernon and the connection between George Washington and Robert E. Lee. And the reason both sides at the beginning of the Civil War wanted Robert E. Lee to lead their army is because Robert E. Lee was widely regarded by everyone as the heir to Washington. He lived at uh, Arlington House, which was, had been built by George Washington's uh, uh, grand, uh, uh, grandson, basically, uh, uh, his adopted grandson, because um, he had no blood heirs, of course. But it was, in, uh, but but that uh, Robert E. Lee married uh, that man's daughter. So, uh, and, and and the house was built as a shrine to Washington, and it, and it and it contained all of the relics from the Revolutionary War. And so, both sides very much wanted Robert E. Lee uh, to to represent them as, as the argument for. Uh, their side, you know, George Washington was on their side. And the story that, that goes forward is so heartbreaking. And, and like I said, you know, it's, it's mostly stuff that, that uh, you know, students of history already know, but, it is, it, but he tells it in, in such a compelling way uh, that you get an understanding of Robert E. Lee that, uh, that, that I had never gotten before. Uh, and, and, and it's not all 100% positive. It's a, it's a very complex uh, image of him, and, and especially the time where you know so much of the Civil War writing is very jaundiced, one way or the other. Uh, this is one of those rare uh, cases where the uh, where the book is very much even-handed, uh, largely because the guy did so much research. Right, right. No, I think it's a it's a it's a great uh, uh, testament to the book that uh, and the author that you chose to to write about him, and I hope it does very well. Maybe we'll get him on. Uh, and he could go more in depth about it. And uh, uh, everybody, check out the column WashingtonTimes.com. Charles Hurt's uh, column this week. Uh, I want to ask you uh, very quickly about uh, some of the things going on here in the couple of seconds we have left. Um, first of all, this uh, this proposed ISIS trade. Um, you know, uh, I mean, first of all, Bergdahl. We're going to talk about Bergdahl uh, in the next couple of segments. Um, th th this th this White House effort reportedly to, to squelch the announcement of desertion charges against Bergdahl. The rumor that I'll find out more about in the next couple of segments that he'll get credit for time served as a quote unquote hostage of the Taliban. The, the White House today saying that uh, Taliban is not, they're not terrorists. I mean, I, you know, what world are we living in, Charles? It's just, it's, it's uh, I, you know, it's uh, my mind blowing uh, week after week. There is no uh, place these people won't go. There's no, uh, you know, there, there's no, uh, no, nothing of reverence anymore. You know, the idea that you would take uh, this guy Bergdahl and uh, and uh, treat him and not, and not treat him as the deserter that he was, it, it just it, it means that there's basically going forward, no one will ever be charged with desertion. And 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 the inverse of that is that that, that service to your country is meaningless. And it's it's very you know it's very troubling and uh, distressing and we have uh, you know almost two two more you know 
whatever it is, 18 more months. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, that, you know what, Charles, they'll be charged with desertion if they leave for reasons other than they sympathize with the Taliban and their <laughs> exactly. parents sympathize with the Taliban and, and, and you know, and the, the parents urge the kid to do whatever he feels like doing. Uh, if you're just afraid or you have other reasons and you want to get back home, you're homesick, whatever, you'll be charged. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Charles, great, great to talk to you, sir. As always, we'll speak to you next week. Thanks, Steve. Charles Hurt, ladies and gentlemen, Washington Times. When we come back, the director of investigations for Judicial Watch, and he and they are suing uh, to get more information, much more information about the five, you know, detainees at Gitmo slash terrorists at Gitmo who were released in order to gain the release of Bergdahl. What's going on here? Uh, they will get to the bottom of it. Believe me, if anybody can, we're coming back. <laughs> 